when you aged out, did you, um, did you, so you spent like a couple of years being like, like tech staff? Yeah. So I was, yeah, I did two years as kind of battery staff based from tech. And then, um, at that point, Don was stepping away and moving to Texas and, um, I didn't flinch one bit. <laughs> I probably should have. But he, he asked me and he asked me and a couple other people if they were interested. And then um, people that are still involved with our Shane being one of them. Uh, but I was at the point in my life that I could just go for it. I was already moving to Nashville and um, this isn't my full time job, but it kind of is. Um, you know, I have some teaching jobs that I do around here and I teach at a university at, for their marching band and stuff. Um, but you have to be able to be able to go on Tuesday at 10 a.m. during the season to do something for Mystique. You know, I have to I have to go deal with these props or, um, you know, I don't think everybody has that opportunity where they're trying to work a regular nine to five and then on the weekend just be the be a different person. Um, it's tough. Do you do you have a music degree? I do. Yeah, I did. I had a music ed degree. Um, from East Tennessee State, and then um, I have spent. I have been a band director in, in my past. And I've been um, a lot of. I like consulting, to where I can have a little bit more free schedule for the for the fall stuff. See, and, and to, to me, it's amazing. Like, I, I I've said this in the past. I've stepped. I there's a big chunk that I missed because of just life commitments in in general. You know, just doing the family thing, and then I somehow found myself back into the marching arts but uh to see now like pretty much the drum staff drum staffs now it's like they, they all you guys are like educated with music degrees and back i come from an era where it was like just dudes that worked a job and taught drums on the side you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's it's awesome to see like all, the amount of education that the staff has now today and even the the, the members i mean they're all like your average drumline member can play like three or four different instruments it's it's amazing i think for us and even when i when i marched what was good for mystique was that a lot of people marched a bunch of drum corps like they went and taught different drum corps and so we were able to kind of bring that back to our little home base and that still happens now where we have a lot of kids that are marching um you know all the different places and that makes it just more He's getting a, a wider swath of it, and uh, we do have people there that only teach mystique. You know, what I mean, they that's all they teach. They do a different job for the rest of their their days, but then they come in and just do that. But then we have some people that are, you know, professional all the time teachers. So I think it's good to have a balance of both. Um, we have perspective, but you also have just that that dedication level from some of these people. Um, it's tremendous. I don't. Again, I don't want to undersell the, the, the staff and the the volunteers, like you said, to, to make it happen. It's a lot of people. Um, I'm going to ask this delicately because because you talked about the, uh, the uh, how how, um, the value that you get from from having uh, people go off and and teach different different cores or even march different cores and then come back and bring that to Mystique. Um, I had a funny. Um, one of my one of my good friends taught bass at Blue Stars a number of years ago, and a Mystique um, member was in one of his lines, and he he told me that like you know they they were you know obviously like there's adjustments like do this play it this way like all of that stuff that that goes on, um, but then there was like a I want to say like maybe he asked him like well what do you guys do at Mystique you know and there was a little bit of like i we don't I talk about you. we yeah, don't yeah, talk yeah. about what we do at mystique we just do what we do <laughs> that vibe so yeah, yeah. so yeah. you know that's that is whatever it is but, but here's my question my question is is it ever difficult to send kids out um maybe not difficult maybe there's just a little bit of reconciling that 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 needs to happen when you guys come back together but but um um is is there at all like is there any kind of process or is it just kids come back and like you got and then it's just immediately we do what we do at Mystique? Yeah, I think and, and we're not afraid. 
our members marching somewhere else is beneficial to us no matter what. Right? They're like they're getting the reps of, of doing it every day, doing all those things. I think there's there's always some technique things that are going to be a little bit different. Um, I don't know what kind of box we would fit into, <laughs> you know, as far as styles of playing. Um, sure. But um, and we try not to be, but I think we do have a certain way of doing it. Um, well, it's probably like like Shane's writing sort of demands a certain thing, and that's that's what it is, just like anybody's book would, you know. Yeah, and I think at this point we have, you know, staff members that have been producing his music for ten years or so um, each, and you know I've been doing it for twenty, um, so. Yeah, having that understanding of how this, just how our stuff works together, I think is um, always key. But I, I was going to say, you know, uh, one thing I wanted to ask, you know, we're talking about the 2001 earlier, and then you go over 2001, and then you look at a show like The Progression of Mystique. Let's take 2011. 2011's Mantra, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so you have. Looking at, just looking at the the production value of the the O one show to see what it's become in that that ten year span, I'm not, and I'm not taking anything away from O one, but for that era that was like cutting edge. And then you look at 2011, you have the big the big prop in the back, and everything's look looks more theatrically like like properly done. And then you, you we talk you know you talk about the the guys in 2017 buying in, but even 2011 you had like I want to say was it the quads that shave their head and you have a lot of members mm-hmm. starting to you know do that mystique stuff mm-hmm. to, to to fit that role fully embody the character yes yeah. is, is that something the members took on for themselves or is that like hey we need you to guys to do this or it would be cool if you guys were to do this i've always been kind of mm-hmm. curious about that the the 2017 was something we told them up front that we're gonna either need to have their hair shaved or that we're just going to need to have like a, there was, there was a couple people who didn't, but the, uh, that, that, that's kind of an outlier, I guess. Um, but like the 20, 2011, the, the quad line, they just, that was something they were hyping on. And, um, th- those, those things are cool to us. And, and if we can give them a vehicle where they can find their identity within that, that world or that, that, um, that place, wherever we, are um the 20 the the hand to man the 2017 one there was a few girls that end up shaving their heads too um by their choice um but it was it was a it was a pretty big commitment i'm sure and uh, it, but, and it's awesome to see when they all do that it, and it's it's like to me it's all those little details that that just help take that stuff i mean it's already great but it just takes it over the top just mm-hmm. a little bit more that it's like, yeah, look at look at them. They're they're really, it sells like that, that to me. Them the quad shaving their heads and the other members that ended up doing that is what helped sell that show. And you know? and well, and and what I would say is it's weird because we're sort of it's uh, we're sort of coming from the place of assuming that there would be that people would hesitate to do that. And and honestly, I think it might be the opposite. It might be like I can't wait to go to Mystique and. And, you know, like fully just buy in and, and do, you know, become that even like in 2013, when every, everything, like when you taboo, like when it, when you guys were like super buttoned up, you know, just fully like wearing that entire thing, you know, like that, that entire persona. Um, I think, I actually think that's a reason why people would want to go there, you know, for the opportunity to do that. Cause you don't, you don't necessarily get that everywhere. No, and, and you don't have the chance, I guess, to be such a performer. Um, well, like the drum corps, where it's just a bigger field, right. just a lot more people, where you you become much more of an individual within a within the cast. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's something we've in the past we've always said: just let your hair grow out before the season starts. Just let it all just kind of get to where. And then um, some some years are more we always have a style to what we're doing as far as what the, the look is, but, um, and we kind of, you know, what, what best fits, you know, we try to give them a couple of options to what best fits their hairstyle or their, um, 
and just kind of their makeup of it. It, it. It's always fun being on this end, trying to guess what kind of mystique show we're going to get, like, the coming year, like, mm-hmm. like this year. It was like, well, are we going to get, like, a dark show? And then it ended up being, you know, mm-hmm. the... The revival, the revival show, and then like the 2019, I liked that because it was like just out there, and then the the live the live sampling and stuff like that that you guys, it, I mean, who else is doing stuff like that? It's it's just oh, that's the the medium show, yeah. Was that the name? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and I I was like, again, sort of, I sort of have this, I don't know what it is. Um, you guys just happen to push my buttons, but I just have this affinity for what you guys do. I like, I went and I looked up the speech. You know that you guys used that year. The medium is the oh, message, um, and I was. E- I think I feel like I was even maybe. Um, I even found that out from a member. Like like they just said, "Hey, go." You know, this is the speech that that we use in the show. Um, I mean, but that's just like it's a uh, it's great, and and I I think that that again, you guys being able to provide that is a uh, is a really awesome thing. Yeah, yeah, and that's. Every show is obviously way different for us in particular, but um, having those things where the both the the staff and the members can feel like they can continue to, to contribute to what the vision is instead of like, you know, Shane or myself or somebody just trying to dictate all the time, like, this is what it is, this is what it is, where everyone understands it and they're able to kind of be in their lane, but um, still contribute on, on their appropriate level. I think it's, it just it helps with the buy-in and it helps with the performance quality and um, something we strive for. And it's not always easy. You know, if you're doing a, like the, the medium one was pretty cool because it was, it spoke to what we actually did right. at that moment. Um, the year before when we did the kind of the voodoo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. The production was, was, you know, off the, off the charts it was not necessarily harder for them to to do but it was a, it was just a different character um i mean some of the production values like like a vegas type show you know mm-hmm. something you'd see like in in, in vegas I mean, but then cool, even the right? challenge yeah. of having the, the pit split like that you know side to side i mean had to be it had to have like some some serious challenges there it was a nightmare <laughs> but yeah it was it was it was cool because it was it, it set the literally set the stage we had eight marimbas but you really didn't Unless you were just counting, you wouldn't notice it. But it was um, yeah, every 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 one of those kinds of things, those kind of design design decisions are they're the challenge that you kind of work through for for that year and um, kind of what that what your your stick is. Your... What, what, what's your guys' design process? I mean, how, like who's who's is there a person like is who is the person that decides this is the show every year? Is it a collaboration? Um, yeah, yeah. What. Is there somebody like drop a seed? Like, it would be cool if we did psh, drop the seed. Or, I think yeah, there's a there's a little bit of kind of, especially from the caption heads and the the, the more the design team. But um, Shane Gwaltney is the the one that has to. At the end of the day, he does have to show. You know, he's doing yeah. all that, but but he's going to be the one that kind of leads that vision, and we are you know everybody's able to kind of contribute to that. We had a. I guess it was this past weekend and the weekend before we had our kind of little design retreat where we have the, the higher up staff and the, uh, the entire design team come in. And um, we've had the same design team for the most part since for the last 10 years. And then we added um, a new sound designer this year, um, CJ Barrow. Um, so, um, but again, alumni of the group. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely an organic thing. We want to, um, kind of throw everything at the wall to see what sticks and what some, sometimes we'll circle back to an idea that we had that we just, we never did or, um, but it's always trying to find where we can have a strong identity. What's, what's going to be mystique. Yeah. Like, like, like for me, the way I picture this is me picturing the way the Mystique show is designed. Have you ever seen, I'm sure you've seen it, like the TV shows where they have the sketches like mm-hmm. for each scene. I've, oh yeah, like storyboard, storyboards. Yeah, storyboards. I picture it like storyboarded, like somebody's there sketching out, okay, this is this is movement one and then movement two. I'm sure it's not like that, but I, in my my imagination, you know. And, and what we end up having is, is a bunch of imagery and a different kind of um, 
kind of mood boards that we kind of move through and just um, really just kind of talking about what possible effects could be and um, you know what and we don't even get we're trying to we're trying to do big broad strokes right off the bat and we're not necessarily into the minutia of some music just yet um, when we first start off with but sometimes it'll um, go from that I think that for that the 2017 show, the, the hand of man, ended up being like it was like a, it was like a picture of a guy. I don't know if it was a skeleton or not, but he had like a he had like this this thing on like a helmet, and it had a like a tube to a backpack, and there was a little tree in the backpack. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, that's super cool. That's awesome. How 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 foreshadowing was that show? You know. <laughs> <laughs> amazing I wish, yeah i wish it hadn't have been yeah right um but now it just kind of depends on what what sparks that initial thing and maybe an image and maybe a, a, a tune um i don't think that's probably similar to a lot of people but it's um i think we do a good job of living within our world and like you said and just uh maximizing what it, what it all could be um within that within those constraints whatever have you ever had a year that you you wish you could like go back and just do over some things i think um you once you get you look back and like why did we play that tune or you know like mm -hmm. <laughs> why did we like try to fix that the whole season and not fix it and, it, and sometimes um i think that's part of part of learning we try to not make that mistake again <laughs> at all costs we have a a list of things we probably wouldn't do anymore. We used to do a lot of barefoot shows. That's tough. <laughs> I can only imagine. I, I, if I could go back and choose, there was a, there was at least one show that I would put shoes on their feet, and I think we we would have played better. I I, th I think a barefoot show probably would have worked for this last year. You know that it, it would have, and I refused. Yeah, um, no, no. Just because it's it just it's just tough to 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 work on it like that, and then most of when you we didn't rehearse it barefoot when we did have those shows, but it's just some, it's just another thing that, that could get in the way. Yeah. You, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the word effect earlier and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. And I know that, that, um, you know, uh, you have the design team and all of that stuff that, that handles all of that stuff. But effect is, is a word that I feel like even to this day, a lot of groups, struggle with in terms of creating it, right? And creating it spe specifically with regards to the sheets, right? Music effect, general effect, visual effect, and all of that stuff. Um, one thing that I really love, I think the most obvious thing, like when you look at Mystique is, is there's a lot of visual effect. There's a lot of like, you know, and embodying the character is part of that, right? But I think something that's underappreciated about what Mystique does is that it always sounds like mystique, but it also very much, probably more so than any other group that I can think of, sounds like the world that your show is being, is set in, you know? Like, like um, I love 2013. And I don't know like what you guys used as far as like touchstones for that, as far as like inspirations for that, but, but, you know, the idea that, that it can still sound like Mystique, but also fully has, I mean, and even this last year with the, with the, you know, the Appalachia, the, the revival thing like that, like, like being able to, to blend. Like take you to that world. Right. Yeah. But, but it still sounds like Mystique, you know? And I think for, you know, it's like, that's effect. That's music effect. That's general effect that, that contributes to all of those things because, because it's evocative, right? It's it's participating in the storytelling. And really, I, I think that a lot of that comes, you know, um, through the vehicle of sound design, right? There, that you know, we're going to be a drumline in a pit. That's what some we know that. Like, but like what, like you said, where where can we take it otherwise, and and where can we kind of bend the the ear of um, just different sounds and different worlds. And um, having been here long enough to see going from just no mic, you know, not very many people being mic'd at all, 
you know, I think 2007 was the last time we, we weren't mic'd at all. Uh, we didn't, we had some sense, but that was the only thing coming through the mix. Um, from that point, you know, we just kind of start getting into miking stuff and then you get into sound design. We kind of dabbled in it in 09 and 10. Um, I think we were actually the first people to ever have a sample played at WGI. I want to, I want to go on the record in 2001 at the end. He says, shall he live? Was that even, were there any rules governing that back then? Nothing. No, I don't think so at that point. Cause it was just, nobody was doing it. Um, but yeah, in 2010, we kind of had some sound design, but it was pretty, pretty minimal. I met Tony Nunez at the advisory board meeting that year. Um, he did a little presentation on some stuff. I hired him as best as I could. He ended up doing the 2011, 13, 11, 12, 13. So um, really good stretch for us. And that kind of, that got us the jump start that we needed into really creating those worlds um, sonically, you know, in addition to all the set design, like you say, and, and taking, taking everybody there. I think having a larger than life floor and, and set and, and how those work together, um, all that kind of stuff just goes into making it feel more organic or just, just kind of staying in that world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since you've been there for so long, um, and I know we've sort of focused on um, the more sort of, I don't, know, I don't know if you call them popular years because you guys were really successful, but when you think back over your time there, were there any particular seasons that stick out to you as being important for Mystique? Um, you know, in the evolution or just, uh, you know, like, because obviously your perspective on it is different than than the public's perspective on it? For us, um, 07 was kind of a real turning point. That was the first year that I was the director the whole year. Um, and then if you go back and look at it, there was a pretty big jump of simultaneous responsibility. I think that was really when that happened. Um, there was, again, people kind of dabbled in it, but then if you look at like, we're doing full phrases and marketing while we have lower body stuff in there. I think that was, um, again, one of our watershed kind of moments or just one where we, we, we learned a lot as a, as a organization. And I think it was the end of a law for me, from my position, I see this a lot in the kids cycle. Like we'll have a kid or a group of kids for, three, four years, two, three, four years, something like that. And those those kind of clumps of kids kind of make those big jumps um, just from having them around um, for a long time. To, but um, other than that, I would think that, you know, they, they all have their merit. I would say that um, there's, I think there's years that I learned more than that just because we either we made a lot of mistakes organizationally or as far, or just things didn't go as smooth as they could have. And um, I would think that um, 2004 was probably a big year for us. Um, again, just that was a, that, that was when we started playing really clean. Um, I would think that, Early WGI, it was really led by high school groups. That was where all the creativity was, and and the independent groups played okay. But the high school groups for like Dartmouth, those like the Batman and all that stuff, like that was where you know it got kind of there's there's a division. And then in O2 when RCC showed up, the level of drumming got higher immediately, like just the level of clarity. And then from that point, it kind of trickled around for everybody. But um, the Mantra Show was probably one of our crown achievements, I would think. Um, and it's just a level of clarity that um, from a design and from a performance that we just, you know, always see. And um, that was a super strong group. Um, but yeah, for me, it's 
stuff to tell. It's you know, it's like picking your baby. Well, yeah, it's it's it, you know, and it's funny. It's like that's the way I sort of word it. I didn't necessarily say like you know what are your favorite years, but just like important to the group, right? As far as as far as moving forward, because we sort of take for granted that groups are just going to stick around every year, and and also stay at the stay at the the quote unquote top of the activity, you know, um, every year. Um, there's a lot of you know a lot of groups that are sitting there that are right on the heels right of of uh you know sort of in that six to ten range the tiers you call it the, yeah the, like there's that there's those tiers, tiers of yeah. groups that would love to know how to you know, like what is keeping them out what is you know and how do you stay in they're hungry hungry to right. to to move up to that top tier yeah 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 and i think it's it's not it's something i'm well aware of and um those other groups that are in our you know neck of the woods typically at, at championships they're very good yeah. all those all the ones from your neighborhood sure. um and they um uh, yeah i don't take it for granted and and, and i i don't want to equate any of it to, to luck or anything like that but i think um we've we've had the benefit of being around a long time and having people that have been here to to know how to lead and and help kind of get the next crop of people ready and um you gotta you gotta be like you said you gotta be hungrier and you gotta be about it a lot more than you want to be for a eight minute show for six months out of the year you gotta you know you gotta be ready to do the extra stuff absolutely and, uh, the, the the fine details you know the extra fine details you know yeah the uh what's uh I can't think of the term right now. I want to say commitment. I want to say commitment to excellence because they're close to football season. But no, we won't get into the the whole Raiders, uh, you know, football talk. The earlier you can be checking things off and and having those things done, it is really about getting that last level of clean at the end of the season. No matter what it is, drum corps or WGI, um, you have to have that pace set at the beginning to where that at the end you're going to be able to get it that last 10 percent that last five percent where it's really hard to play clean all the time y'all <laughs> and i think it's um you know it's not something that you always get every single piece of everything even some of our best years i've i had things left on the list you know to take care of but you just can't get to everything Attention to detail, that's the term I was looking for. Mm-hmm. You gotta have that that extra little attention to detail, you know, to make sure yep. everything gets taken. Yeah, care it's of. like it's I think for anybody that's done this for a while, either in drum corps or indoor, you realize that there's there's all those things like attention to detail and um the ability to problem solve uh with with minimal impact, right? Mm-hmm. 